Have you ever been caught in a deception that someone told you a lie about and you believed? You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. We're back in the studio and ready to talk about the truth today. It's no fun being caught in someone else's lie that they've spun for you. It makes you feel like a, a fly caught in a spider's web because you were taken in. But we've all been in that situation at one time or another in our life. And today we're going to talk about uh, the spider web that is spread in the insurance world to catch the unexpecting fly. Yeah, and first of all, I'd like to start out with the quote. Uh, this was a quote that you started out one of your recent blogs with. It says, A good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children, but a worthless person's wealth is stored up for the righteous. That verse comes from Proverbs, uh, written by Solomon, the son of King David. Yeah, that's Proverbs 13, 22, and uh, that is our, like, uh, our, our fountainhead. That's what we do. That's why we're in the life insurance industry. You know, uh, Paul wrote to his uh, son Timothy in the faith, and he said, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially his own household, he's worse than someone who doesn't even believe in God. Mm. Those are some pretty harsh words. Um, and yet we have many people today and many people who call themselves Christians that are not doing anything to really secure a legacy for their children, let alone their grandchildren. Yeah, there seems to be a strange disconnect. In fact, we've even been criticized for applying the Bible to money and uh, insurance products before. Well, there's uh, the Bible has a lot to say about money. In fact, as in Genesis 2, it said God made gold and it was good. Uh -huh. And that's the first mention of money in the Bible. But uh, the Bible talks uh, more about money than it does about faith and prayer. Mm -hmm. And Jesus spent a huge amount of time talking about money matters and telling stories about finances and, and economics. Fascinating. So it really is a life guide that we can use with money and stewardship in addition to faith and prayer and the, the, the many things that people already think about it. That's true. To. You know, our friend Rabbi Lappin um, put us on to the fact that blood and money are the same word in Hebrew, and they are, it's the, the Hebrew word D-A-M, dam. And that's more than half of Adam's name. So money is very much connected to the human race. It is part of us. Fascinating. Fascinating. So here in America, you know, the share of the uh, United States households headed by married parents with children um, under the age of 18 has decreased dramatically over the last 50 years. I think that's part of the reason that people are no longer looking to build that legacy because, you know, back when um, I was a kid and growing up in the, in, uh, the 60s and 70s, more than 40% of households had two parents, a mother and a father in them. Mm -hmm. And today that has dropped to under 18%. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see this happen in culture and historically when, when there isn't a two-parent household, a man and a and a man and a, a woman running a household, a married couple, we see all kinds of things happen in our culture. We see crime go up. Mm -hmm. We see, uh, we see uh, uh, you know, uh, psychological issues. We mm -hmm. see more gang problem. We see more uh, suicides. All of that because that is not the order God intended for us to, to run a, a household in. Yeah, and sad. I think that, you know, Malachi talks about um, the problem with society at that time was the father needed to turn his hearts back to his children, mm -hmm. and the children needed to turn their attention back to their parents. And that's what Jesus came for, is to help that happen. And now we're seeing a decline in that in America, which claims to be a Christian country. Mm -hmm. And that is really sad because... When we're not preparing for that and working toward that, we see this dis disintegration, and then people start looking to government instead of God for their solutions. Yeah. So when it, when it comes to money uh, in this country, you know, having fewer families that are functional 
and working together, living together, you know, that is, uh, that, that could be a huge detractor from building wealth and building a legacy for the future because who's going to get it? Well, some, somebody that you don't know real well don't necessarily care about enough to, uh, to, <clears throat> to live there and support, and, uh, support them. And we run into to way too many people who say, I don't care about leaving a dime to my children. I just want to make sure that I have enough for myself so sad. that I don't run out of money. Well, there's nobody on the face of this earth that can tell you how much money you're going to need because no. of inflation, because of the fact that stock markets come and destroy what you thought. Jesus warned, he said, there's going to be moth and rust and thieves that break in and still, and we've got a Federal Reserve that stills on a consistent basis from all of us. Mm -hmm. Inflation has destroyed more than 2% of everything you save. And the ability to earn that has just not been there since, well, the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. And so you save and hoard and try to store up for the future. It's like the, the farmer that Jesus told a story about. He's going to tear down his barn and build bigger ones and put all this stuff in it and kick back and relax and just be merry for the rest of his life. And God says, you fool. Tonight, you die, then who gets everything you've got? Mm -hmm. And that's a totally, you know, building up wealth in that sense is totally different than building a legacy. It is, because he was just going to heap it on himself, and that's the mentality that we're seeing more and more frequently. And I think it comes because, uh, just like Paul uh, wrote to the Corinthians, he says, there's going to come a time when people no longer listen to the facts. Mm. They're going to be interested in hearing about satisfying their own cravings and gathering around them great numbers of experts mm -hmm. to tell them anything that they desire to hear. That sounds and, a lot like today. And these people will ignore the truth. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do, like you said at the very beginning, John, is we're trying to share people the truth mm -hmm. about money, and we're going to talk more about that spider web that the insurance company has spread to catch the unsuspecting fly. Yeah, and it's not just the insurance company. If we if we look at uh, at human nature in general, this is a this is a factor throughout human nature. Um, and the only reason that it continues to be a factor is because people fall for it. Uh, they they get a little bit greedy mm. in some cases. And uh, how how does that play a role in the deception that people <clears throat> face today? Well, we know that greed is uh, idolatry, mm -hmm. and idolatry is anything that comes between us and our Creator. And so when people start focusing on what the experts say they can accumulate and hoard away so that they will live comfortably the rest of their life, um, there's a little bit of greed involved in that. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very careful that that doesn't displace our trust in our Creator who promises that... He will feed us just like he feeds the birds of the air uh, that neither sow nor toil nor reap, and yet he, none of those fall to the ground without him knowing it. Mm -hmm. And even Solomon in all of his glory and riches wasn't able to clothe himself like those. So he says it's foolish to be worrying about what you're going to put on and what you're going to eat in the future. God will take care of that if we put our trust in him first. He says all these other things will be added to us. Mm -hmm. And so... Now, how do we plan for the future? What should be our goal? Yes, we should take care of our own. Otherwise, we're worse than a non-believer. We need to store something up in case there's an emergency in the future. But do we then put our trust in that, what we've stored up? No. We should, if we do, we as soon as we do, it can disappear. The, you know, in the Old Testament, it says, your money will make itself wings like an eagle and fly off to heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as we put our trust in it, because it's God who provides our needs. And as long as we're managing that money wisely and we don't become greedy about it and get our focus and our love attached to that instead of our creator, then things will go well with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and not, not to say that that money still won't disappear in some in some cases, because we don't have full control of the taxes and regulations, but it won't take our joy with it. That's in true. That case. And, and we'll still have the ability then to... Uh, make it again or make something again. You know, uh, as, as, as we were studying for our um, Series 65 exam, we were taught something in that book that was really astounding, and that is in our society today, there's only three places that guarantee your money will be there when you go to get it. Mm -hmm. So if we're putting money away, storing it for that emergency in the future or to take care of some needs that we might have in the future that we can't work and, and generate the income to do. There's only three places we can park that money, 
and know that it will be there for us when we get back. The first one is a bank account because it's guaranteed up to $250,000. Sure, through the FDIC. The second place is U.S. Treasuries because it's backed up by the IRS's ability to collect taxes. So we buy a bond, a note, or a bill through the U.S. Treasury. It's guaranteed that it will be there for us if we go back and get it. And the third place is certain contracts with an insurance company. Mm -hmm. And those certain contracts are a guaranteed fixed annuity, not something that's indexed or tied to the market, but a guaranteed Mm -hmm. return. And And the second contract with an insurance company is a whole life insurance policy. Hmm. Those are the only three places that we can park money. Now, some of those have better uh, qualities than others. Mm -hmm. The bank account has liquidity, but as soon as we access our money, guess what? We lose the growth on it. Bank accounts don't have super good uh, interest rates right now. Interest rates are not really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Same with U.S. Treasuries. They're not real liquid because if we need it before the the treasury has matured, then we're going to pay a penalty and we're going to lose some of our money. Or you're going to have to sell it at the going rate, whatever, Mm -hmm. and you're subject to the interest rates or whatever has changed there. Sure. Uh, With an annuity, um, that's going to give you a guaranteed income for the rest of your life. But if you need more than what was guaranteed in your annuitized payment, then you're going to be penalized and you're going to have to pay a percentage back to the insurance company. So so easily, sure. Mm -hmm. The whole life insurance companies. Uh, restriction is that it takes a certain amount of time to have access to as much money as you paid for it. Mm-hmm. But once we reach that that critical point, then we can access more money than we've put in, and it doesn't inhibit the growth of the money that we've put in. It mm-hmm. continues to grow. So all of those have different attributes and qualities, but we have found that the whole life insurance policy gives us the most flexibility and the ability to manage it. And now come along the insurance companies to spread the spider web. Yeah, so, 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 so real quick before we dive into that, I want to go back just a little bit here because even just in the recent history of the United States, you know, you, we talked about deception being widespread, kind of part of human nature. If we go back, you know, everyone's kind of familiar with the Wild West and the stories of the snake oil salesman that would travel along from town to town. Sure. You know, basically telling people what they wanted to hear instead of what they needed to hear. I think we and still got a snake salesman that we, sells. Uh, we do, we do. <laughs> but they they kind of attract the, uh, you know, the people that are greedy. Kind of attract these things. The people that want to get rich. Uh, the Bible actually warns about that. Um, so this is nothing new. It's just new players, and on a new playing field. And, and so, and, so the the uh, the circumstances look different, but it's the same aspects at work. And now we're going to talk about the spider web uh, that the insurance companies. Uh, have as well with a product called Index Universal Life Insurance. So the insurance companies weren't really happy about the fact that they had to take all the liability on a whole life product. They wanted to um, they wanted to get rid of some of their responsibility, and so they offered another product that is classified as permanent life insurance, mm-hmm. and yet it's built on a platform of the most expensive insurance you can buy. And that's is? renewable term. Okay. So renewable term insurance goes up in price as you get older. Sure. And so the closer you are to the point that the probability of your death is going to have, the higher the premium. Mm-hmm. So someone, uh, you know, in their 20s can get a million dollars of coverage for, uh, you know, $20, $25 a month, whereas uh, someone in their 70s that would buy that same policy might be paying twenty five or 30000 for that million dollars of coverage. So in a renewable product, it goes up every year until you get to that point where you're paying those extreme premiums. Mm. Now that's hidden in an IUL policy, whether it's a traditional um, universal product, whether it's an indexed universal product, or whether it's a variable product. All these products are universal products. They're called permanent insurance, but they're built on this one-year renewable term. Mm-hmm. That's why the economic for uh, the Center for Economic Justice warns consumers to stay away from these products. They say they are sold by agents and insurance companies that are sold on a false premise and with complicated contracts. Hmm. And yet, because people are greedy, they want to see the possibility or of 
having a huge fast return without having to pay hardly anything for this product. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets people caught into these. And it's almost on a monthly basis that we find somebody that was suckered into buying one of these products that has now reached the point where their premiums are so high and the interest rates in that contract have not generated like they were pro projected. And they're saying, I'm going to be without any insurance and I'm not going to get anything out of this again. It's, it's, it's because of the, the, the foundation of those products, well, that renewable term is not permanent. It's not like you, permanent. Like you said. Now, could it be permanent in some cases if you got enough money into the contract? Potentially. But it, it's base, It's not guaranteed to be permanent. And well, so the, the fact of calling it a permanent product is kind of a myth. Well, and the problem with that is who's going to pay $2 million to have a half a million dollars of coverage? Yeah, if you want to pay the premiums, it'll be there. But who's stupid enough to do that? Yeah. And this is the problem that's happening. People are not being exposed to the complete truth because they're blinded by greed. And all they want to see is... Oh, look what could be if everything goes just like it's supposed to and like we projected here, not like it's supposed to because it's going to go the way it's supposed to regardless mm -hmm. of what's projected. Yeah. Now, people, people um, if you've been listening to this podcast, um, you, you know that we've talked about index universal life insurance before. Some of these pitfalls, we try to, atta we try to look at it from different perspectives from time to time. And if it wasn't such a popular product, we wouldn't talk about it so much. But this product continues to be sold more and more, and yet the, uh, the, 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 the problems with it, the inherent problems, if the design of the product are going to be a problem down the road. And so we have to continue warning about this, looking at some of those different perspectives. Um, and if you look on the Internet today, you can find uh, credible sources – uh, quote credible, let's say, backing up just about any opinion you, that you want on these subjects. And so what's really important is that we have to search for the truth in well, these things. We have to have discernment, and we have to divorce ourselves from a fear that we might not be taken care of, and number two, greed that we can get a lot more for nothing mm -hmm. uh, or for very little, and get those added to that because discernment and wisdom do not are not driven by greed or fear. That's a good point. They're driven by knowledge. So can you say that again? The uh, ability to discern uh -huh. what is truth is not driven by greed or fear. It's driven by knowledge. Oh, and we so have true. to we have to take the blindfolds off and be able to see clearly what's happening here. And so in in doing that, when we look at any permanent life insurance policy, whether it's a whole life policy, a universal policy, an indexed universal policy, we have to look at the guaranteed columns. Mm -hmm. That's the contract. Anything in the non-guaranteed or the projected columns is just that. It's just an expectation or a speculation that this could happen. And that's where people get in trouble. Yeah, so so one of the ways that's uh, one of the things that's unique about index universal life insurance. You you talked about how universal life insurance is all based on the foundation of renewable uh, term insurance. But one of the uh, fascinating features that people find with index universal life insurance is that they get to participate in the market in some way. So if the market goes up, then hey, their life insurance can go up. And if the market goes down, then supposedly they have this guaranteed floor that they don't have to worry about losing money with the well, market. So that so they think they're getting something there. Can you talk about how that actually works behind the scenes in an IUL product? Well, first of all, let me just say that that's not unique just to index universal. There are whole life products that you can mirror the market as well. With, with the dividend? With the component. dividend. Okay. You can, instead of having a dividend paid to you by, based on the insurance company's profits, you can say, instead of doing that, I'm just going to um, to to follow the uh, an, an index, just like uh, an index universal product does. Okay. And so there are products out there that do that. However, let's talk a little bit about why we prefer to take the dividend from the profits of the company. Okay. Because there's very few companies that have been around for over 100 years that have paid dividends. Mm -hmm. Now, we can look at a few of them. There's 15 of them. Okay. A, a DuPont is one of them, General Mills, Johnson Controls, ExxonMobil. And of those 15, there's several of those that are projected 
not to be able to pay dividends this year because this year was a nasty year for a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. However, there are 26 mutually held life insurance companies that have consecutively paid dividends for over 100 years and still know they're going to be pay, able to pay dividends in the future. Now, now that's, that's quite fascinating that so many more mutually held life insurance companies are able to pay dividends. And Mr. Nash talked about this in his book, uh, The uh, Becoming Your Own Banker. Can you tell us a little bit about why that is? Do, well, how, how do insurance companies pay dividends and how is that different from the way most stock held companies do? Well, mutual life insurance companies do not invest in stocks. They have no stockholders. And so they're not having to entice stockholders every quarter that they're making a profit. I see. So they're not, they're not you know, having to report to those stockholders every sure. Yeah. Okay. And so they're not under so much pressure to have great stock ratings every quarter to show entice people to buy more of their stock. Okay. So mutual life insurance companies, they get their... Uh, capital from our premium dollars when we buy a policy. Mm -hmm. And so they're responsible then for guaranteeing that they're going to pay a death benefit. So if someone buys a whole life product for, you know, $10,000, they're on the hook that if that person dies, they're going to have to pay several hundred thousand dollars Mm -hmm. to that person's beneficiary. So they have to manage their money very, very, very carefully. Yeah. And if you were in a position like that and didn't have any stockholders to take up the slack, that means you have to collect a little bit more in premium than what you think you're going to need just to be sure that you have a safety net. Absolutely. And so when we see a year like last year in the last two quarters where we see mortality rates rising by 40% in 18 to Mm 64-year-olds, the insurance companies are ready for that because that's how they plan their business model. They know these, uh, these mortality rates fluctuate. They go up and down all the time. And the nice thing to know is that even with that increase in mortality rate, the cost to the insurance company is going to be less than what they paid out in the 9-11 terrorist attack. Mm. Actually, it's going to be less than three times less. And so that's just like a little hump in the road for the insurance companies because of their such exact planning Mm. and how they keep money in reserve to be able to help this. Now, that means they're very profitable. And when we get to share in their dividends and their profits, that's the dividend that's paid back to us. That's why I prefer just to keep my products earning dividends rather than to go try to gamble in the -hmm. the stock market. And so because the insurance companies are collecting more in premium than what they need, uh, the IRS actually recognizes that a dividend paid by a mutually held life insurance company is different than a dividend paid by a regular stock held company mm. because they actually classify it as a return of premium. Yes, it's a it's actually kind of a refund because if the company made this much money, they really didn't have to collect that much premium for you. And so as they give that pre- that money back to you, it's called a refund or a return mm-hmm. of premium. And, and, and But it still does include some of those profits of the insurance company because those dividends over time can be end up being more than what somebody has paid in premiums, uh, depending on the policy, depending on the design, and some other factors. Yes. Now, unfortunately, there are some mutual life insurance policies uh, that don't have the option to buy paid-up insurance. This slows down the dividends that the policy can earn And what that does is it makes us be very diligent about where we put our premium dollars. We want to make sure our premium dollars are going to a company that allows us to buy paid-up insurance so the dividends can get higher quicker, Mm -hmm. and those dividends then always buy more paid-up insurance. Now, a piece of paid-up insurance is a piece of insurance you buy and never, ever pay a premium on it again. Mm. But you keep earning dividends on it, and it uh, is something that you own. It's like equity. And if you surrender the policy or need to, then it's going to be refunded to you, mm-hmm. that equity. Uh, if you do not surrender the policy, then it becomes capital that you can borrow, uh, uh, use as leverage to borrow from the insurance company. Mm-hmm. And paid up insurance is something that's only in whole life, isn't it? It's only available in whole life. In fact, this whole life insurance is the only product that you have equity in. Uh, index universal policy, you're just renting that t- base term that has an increasing rent cost to it every year. Mm-hmm. And um, there really is no equity. 
It's hmm. just an overpaid premium or interest that you've earned. There's no real equity in it. Fascinating. So do IUL products pay dividends as well? There are no IUL products that pay a dividend because you have no ownership. And -hmm. without ownership, you're not part of the company. You're just someone that is leasing. Fascinating. Fascinating. So in theory, uh, the IUL products that insurance companies sell, if they're a mutual insurance company, then the whole life insurance uh, policy owners are benefiting from that. Uh, because the IUL is more profitable for the insurance company and the whole life policy owners as part owners in the company should benefit from that, right? Well, you know, every time I ask a company uh, why you sell these index universal products or these universal products, they say it takes the risk away from the company and puts it back on the policyholder. That's the that means the that, that's true. That means the insurance company is going to make more money on it. Mm -hmm. And so if we're in a position to share the profits of that insurance company uh, by owning a whole life policy, we're in a better position than taking, assuming the risk that the, that the universal products mm-hmm. that put on us. Yeah, and, be, and because the, uh, you know, insurance is purchased in the first place to avoid risk, it doesn't make sense to us as consumer advocates why consumers would want to purchase a product where they're not translating uh, the risk that they think they might be back to the insurance company. That's an important factor to consider. So I'd like to just close today with a quote from um, Bernie Burnham, director of the Center for Economic Justice. He says, uh, consumers should stay away from IUL policies because insurance companies and the agents who sell these products have no obligation to work in the consumer's best interest. Hmm. There's there's quite a bit there. I agree with his warning about the IUL there. Um, the the last part there about uh, the insurance agents don't have an obligation to work in the consumer's best interest. Uh, legally, uh, the, the, under the legal standard the insurance agents work, that would be true for uh, agents selling indexed universal life insurance as well as whole life insurance, wouldn't it? It uh, There's a legal uh, binding that an agent has to represent. Uh, that's called a fiduciary responsibility is to take care of uh, your clients like you would take care of your own money. But selling an IUL policy, unless we, as an agent, tell all of our clients the risks that are involved in it, then we're not really representing the client's best interest. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing more and more frequently. All people are doing is saying, look what is possible, but there's no risk that that possibility might never happen being explained. And that's the danger. That's the danger. So you, you need to understand the products that you're purchasing and, um, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to tell you how those products work and help you to make sure that you get what you really need to, uh, to, to make sure your financial future has the guarantees that you need to depend upon for the future. So I'm going to, um, your book, uh, How to Build Sustainable Wealth, you talk more about index universal life insurance, go into some of the details that we've talked about today. You can get that book on our website, life-benefits.com. You can also call our office at 702-660-7000. And some people think that they need to read a book or do a whole bunch of studying before they ever contact us. But if this is something that you know you need to do something different this year in 2022 for your finances, Um, I do want to clarify, it's not a requirement to read the book before you contact us. Um, At some point, you probably will want to read the book because there is no substitute for education and and making sure that you have the knowledge that you need to make the decisions for your financial future. Um, But if you you know you need to do something different with your finances for 2022, uh, give us a call and set up a strategy session. You can reach us at 702-660-7000. You know, something that's fascinating, every time we talk about the universal products, index universal products, we get some agent giving us a ring or, a, or an email telling us, why are you always down on IUL products? Why are you always bashing universal products? And our reply to them is always the same. Show us an IUL product or a universal product that can guarantee the results a whole life policy will and will bring you on and let you share it with our audience. The we're, thing we're is, open. we're open. The thing is, is there's no IUL product or universal product out there that can provide the guarantees that a whole life policy can. We never had an agent take us up on that offer. So think about uh, the the different products that are available. Make make sure that you're not approaching your financial decisions with a spirit of greed or fear. 
Um, You're listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. Have a wonderful week, and we'll be back next week. And stay away from the spiders, buddy.